Hello, my name is Kelsey Zelma Herx, also known as Zelma Zelma, and I'm doing this again. I am a playwright and a recovering actor and general Shakespeare nerd, and today we're going to be talking about A Midsummer Night's Dream. I'm gonna try and do this again in 15 minutes, but there's a lot in this play, so that might not happen. Quick intro. Everyone knows this one. For some reason, it's usually the one that's given to kids as their first Shakespeare, which is wild because it is wildly inappropriate. Who here was given Midsummer Night's Dream as their first Shakespeare play? Let me know. Everyone thinks it's a fun and easy play and they can just throw it together, but it is super hard. <laughs> I mean, all Shakespeare plays are hard to make good, but anyone who tries to tell you that Midsummer Night's Dream is somehow easier than the other ones is full of it. Death is easier than Midsummer Night's Dream. Romeo and Juliet is easier than Midsummer Night's Dream. Midsummer Night's Dream is one of the hardest ones to actually produce. It's an all hands on deck kind of play. There needs to be some strong, consistent stylistic choice about the fairies. The text is super complicated for everyone. There are no slouch roles. Everyone needs to be really good at Shakespeare. There are four major plot lines that all need to be clear and distinct, and it all needs to come together at the end, and everyone needs to buy in and bring their A game from the fairies to the lovers to Theseus and Hippolyta to the director or else it'll just be a big mess. And lastly, before I start, if you've ever been in the forest after dark, think about what that was like. Disorienting? Scary? Thrilling? That is the play. A forest where anything is possible. Okay, let's get started. So, Ancient Athens. Theseus, the Duke of Athens, is getting ready to marry Hippolyta, queen of the Amazons. He defeated her in battle. They have to wait like four more days to get married because Hippolyta is on her period. It seems like Hippolyta is not super delighted by this marriage, so having those four extra days is probably a good thing. Aegeus storms in with his daughter Hermia, her boyfriend Lysander, and the guy Aegeus wants Hermia to marry, Demetrius. Hermia wants to marry her boyfriend Lysander, who is every bit as wealthy and has just as high standing in society as Demetrius, but her dad is so dead set on her marrying Demetrius that he's calling upon some obscure Athenian law that says if your daughter doesn't do what you want her to do, you can put her to death or send her to be a nun. All this is further complicated by the fact that Demetrius used to hook up with Hermia's best friend. Helena. We never find out why he swapped one girl for the other. Helena is just as rich as Hermia and is in love with him, but there is something about her that makes him ashamed of the connection. Or Demetrius is just a rude boy. Those are the stakes. Hermia has to marry Demetrius or be put to death. I get this vibe from Theseus the Duke that he wants to change things up. He's not like a regular Duke, you know? He's like a cool Duke. But at the end of the day, he still has to follow the laws, so... He gives Hermia until his and Hippolyta's wedding day to make her choice. Everyone exits except Lysander and Hermia. She's not thrilled about either of her options, and Lysander is like, hey, babe, the course of true love never did run smooth. And they hatch this plan to run off and live with his aunt in the next town over, where Athenian law can't get them. Hermia is hype. Enter Helena, Hermia's best friend. Hermia is like, hey, you look nice today. And Helena goes off on her, like, you take that back. You know I'm ugly. How dare you? They tell Helena their plan to leave town, kind of forgetting that that means Hermia is leaving her best friend to fend for herself, those heartless bastards. They leave Helena alone to process the information. Helena has one of the hardest speeches in the play, which is basically like, cool guys, I'm really happy for you. It's very relatable. Who among us has not been the single person forced to interact with the happy, in love people? So in the end, she resolves to tell rude boy Demetrius about Hermia and Lysander leaving town. He'll follow them, she can follow him, and then he'll fall in love with her again, probably. I, I, it's not a great plan, but um, it's... Oh, it's all she's got. Cut to a group of laborers, colloquially known as the Mechanicals. They meet up to talk about a community theater play they're planning for the Duke's upcoming wedding. Now each Mechanical character is only as interesting as the actors decide to make them, but each one of them has the opportunity to steal the show. That no small roles, only small actors thing. It really checks out with this group. But since they're not individually important to the story, I'm only going to introduce Peter Quince, the director of the show, and Bottom the Weaver, the local community theater Peter group star. Bottom kind of bullies Peter Quince through this whole scene. He's that guy, I don't know if you've ever done community theater, if you haven't, you should, it's awesome. But he's that guy in the cast that has been doing plays with the Main Street Players or whatever the group is for like eight years and he's like, oh, I, I think I know how the theater works by now. Constantly questions the director, generally makes a nuisance of himself, you know that guy. But oh, damn it, he's actually pretty good, so that's why he keeps getting cast. So yeah, that's bottom. But also there's this element of... Okay, I'm just gonna say it. Peter Quince is in love with bottom. I know, I know. 
I understand you're not ready for a truth this powerful, but it is a really good reason why he would put up with all the shit Bottom puts him through. They plan to do Pyramus and Thisbe, which is basically like Proto Romeo and Juliet, and they decide to meet in the forest to rehearse. I get it, finding rehearsal space is a bitch. And then they part ways. Now we have met the humans, and it's time to cut to the forest and meet the spirits who live there. We meet Puck. He tells us what a knavish sprite he is, and we love him. And then enter Titania and Oberon. Who are both in town? Make sure that Theseus and Hippolyta have a good wedding night, if you know what I mean. We've met them in the middle of an ongoing fight. Titania has a little changeling child that Oberon wants. The kid was the son of a beloved priestess who served Titania, so when this woman died in childbirth, Titania did the reasonable thing and kidnapped her baby. Don't get mixed up with fairies, you guys. Even if they love you, they don't understand that kidnapping your baby is not a good way to remember you after you've died. So, you know, this isn't just any changeling. This one has sentimental value, and Titania's not gonna just go gifting it to Oberon. And Oberon, who probably would have gotten bored with the kid once he realized babies are useless, has instead latched on to this one thing simply because it is Titania's and not his, and she won't share, and he will not let it go because it's not because of this dumb fight, all of nature is unsettled. Basically, their fight is causing catastrophic climate change, so I don't know what they're fighting about now. But Titania is very, uh, very adamant and will not budge. The kid is hers, and that is that. Titania and her crew exit, leaving a very angry Oberon. Oberon hatches a scheme. He's going to drug Titania with a special flower that will make her fall in love with the first thing she sees. He'll make her fall in love with some monster, and presumably she'll be so humiliated by this that she'll give him whatever he wants. Oberon sends Puck to find this magical flower, so he's alone when Demetrius runs into the forest clearing with Helena hot in his trail. Oberon eavesdrops as Demetrius tries to shake her off. Helena says she'll be his dog, and even if he rejects her or beats her, she'll follow him like a spaniel. Sequel parts kinky and problematic. Demetrius runs off and leaves her to fend for herself in the spooky forest, and Helena exits now truly lost. Puck returns with the flower, and Oberon is like, great, I'll take care of the Titania thing, you take some of this flower, and there's this Athenian asshole being followed around by this girl. Find them and make him fall in love with her. They both exit, and Titania and her fairies get ready for bed. They sing a little song, one fairy stands guard, and apparently does a horrible job because Oberon immediately walks on and saunters up to Titania's sleeping bower and anoints her with love juice. Don't at me that is actually what they call it in the play and bounces just then lysander and hermia find the clearing apparently lysander sucks at reading maps so they're lost now and it's dark and they're never going to make it to his aunt's house tonight so they decide to go to sleep lysander wants to cuddle but hermia wants to find a nice respectful socially distanced spot to sleep just then rude boy demetrius runs on with helena see how this works things just happening one right after the other slightly overlapping no real downtime it just all just rolls right into the next thing all shakes Shakespeare's like this to some extent. Nothing kills the mood in a Shakespeare play faster than a poorly executed scene transition. The next scene really should be starting before anyone even has time to notice the previous scene is over. And if you must have a scene transition, it should build the world or the characters somehow. But the fourth section of Midsummer Night's Dream, get out of here with those scene transitions. Anyway, rude boy Demetrius runs on with Helena tailing him. He outruns her again, exits. She notices Lysander and is like, oh shit. Are you dead? <laughs> she shakes him awake, and since she is the first person that he's seen since the magic, he is immediately in lust with her. In, sorry, in love with her. But, you know, a lot of the text is very horny. Helena runs away from Lysander and he follows, leaving Hermia sleeping alone in the spooky forest. Next in the clearing, which I'll remind you is still the Fairy Queen's Bower, are the Mechanicals for their middle of the night rehearsal. It is really difficult to find time when six people with full-time jobs can rehearse, so middle of the night it is. They rehearse, it's so awful. And again, uncomfortably relatable if you've ever done a play. Puck sees these rough working men and is like, oh perfect! Don't fuck with fairies you guys. I know they seem cool and sexy, but they are not to be trusted. Puck transforms Bottom into a horrible donkey man hybrid. <laughs> Bottom is horrifying donkey man, accidentally scares off his fellow mechanicals, and is left alone in the spooky forest. He thinks his friends are playing a trick on him, so he sings loudly because That'll show him. And his singing awakens Titania. She is immediately in love with him. And she and her fairies whisk him away for some family-friendly PG-rated adventures. Oh, focus is messed up. I messed it up. Come on, camera. Come on.
There we go. Good job. Next scene, Puck tells Oberon about Tatani falling in love with Bottom as horrifying donkey man hybrid. Oberon is delighted. And he did the Athenian thing too, so the bonus side quest is done too. Enter rude boy Demetrius and Hermia? He's trying to get her to marry him still, and she is convinced that he has killed her beloved Lysander and is furious. Hermia exits and rude boy Demetrius passes out. Now, we know, and Puck and Oberon very quickly figure out, that Puck has f up. Oberon sends Puck to find Helena and personally applies the love juice. No, I will not stop calling it that. On Demetrius' eyes. Enter Helena, followed by Lysander, who's like, look, Demetrius will never love you the way that I do. And then she immediately trips over the sleeping Demetrius, who wakes up and falls in love with her, falls back in love with her. Now she has two lads vying for her attention. Just then, Hermia arrives and hijinks ensue. This scene, the four lovers scene, is honestly one of the greatest group scenes in Shakespeare. It defines hijinks ensue. I cannot do it justice in summary, and it's too long for me to read to you like I did last week. All you need to know is that everyone is really mad at each other and Puck manages to make them all fall asleep in a pile and get the love juice off Lysander's eyes. I know, I know. If you know the play, you are hating me right now, but I I could seriously do an entire video just on this scene. I do not have time here. Gotta move on. Titania, fairies, and Donkey Bottom enter. Bottom has clearly adjusted very well to the life of luxury. It's, you know, it's what he deserves. Titania and Bottom fall asleep, and Oberon comes on stage to tell Puck from the audience not to worry. He kink shamed Titania into handing over her changeling child, whom the audience has almost certainly forgotten about by now, and thinks it's time to undo the spell. He wakes her up. She's like, I had the weirdest dream. And he's like, no dream, baby, you fucked that. And she sees Donkey Bottom and is horrified. I'll never forget my poor high school director trying to figure out a way to sensitively talk about Donkey Dick to the actor that played Titania. So when you see him, the disgust needs to be visceral in a way that you know, goes beyond the mere image of him. And there's probably some physical discomfort too because a donkey... Anyway, Titania and Oberon make up and exit. Oh my god, we're almost done, you guys. It's so close. Theseus, the Duke, and his intended Hippolyta, remember them? Are in the forest hunting. They find the sleeping lovers. Oh, uh, Aegeus, Hermia's dad is there too. And Demetrius is like, hey, you know what? I actually don't want to marry your daughter anymore. I'm in love with Helena again. And the Duke is like, great, we'll have a triple wedding. I'll see you in Athens. And he pieces out. Which leaves us with the final thread to tie up, the mechanicals. Bottom wakes up with his own fool's head and is like, whoa. I had the craziest dream. I should make a play about it. Cut back to Athens at Peter Quint, the community theater director's house. All the mechanicals are sad and they think Bottom is possibly dead. And then Bottom bursts on stage with the rousing, where are these lads? Where are these hearts? And they all cheer and they hug him and they're all so happy to see him. If done right, I have seen this entrance bring a tear to the eye, to, to my eye. The, this entrance has made me cry before. It's it's just so pure. <laughs> Bottom announces that their play is in the running to perform at the Duke's wedding. Indeed, Theseus chooses their play and settles in to watch the shit show. We get to watch it too and enjoy Theseus and the lads heckle the ever-loving shit out of them. It is truly delightful. And if you have never seen the play within a play, watch it. At one point, Hippolyta is dying of secondhand cringe. And Theseus says what I think is honestly one of the tenderest descriptions of theater I've ever heard. He says, the best in this kind are but shadows. And the worst are no worse if imagination amend them. Which is to say, what does it matter, really, if a play is good? I mean, no matter how good you are, someone is going to think your play sucks. And by that same token, someone is going to find something to love and connect with about any play, even a terrible play. The joy in making theater really is about telling a story to a group of people sharing the same air as you. And no matter the quality, there's something kind of thrilling about that. There's something brave about the vulnerability of that. I really miss theater, you guys. 
the play ends and the lovers all head off to bed and Tanya and Oberon bless the house and Puck bids farewell to the audience. The end. Oh my god. I do not listen to my own advice. I picked this one because I know the play really well and I thought it would be quick to just write out the story and I was f***ing wrong. I am a damn fool you guys. I hope you enjoyed video number two on my Shakespeare channel. Likes and comments might trick the YouTube algorithm into thinking I'm valid. I'll post one of these every Thursday so go ahead and subscribe if you're into that. I was really happy. I already got a couple of subscribers from my first video. I, I wasn't expecting really anyone to watch it but um i know you're all my personal friends and like my aunt but the gesture really means a lot to me so yeah if you have any shakespeare buddies maybe go ahead and share this with them i don't know how to sign off yet bye he outruns again he outruns again her girl